Hello and welcome to Gabbett Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today I was lucky enough to get an interview with Derek Elliott. Now you may have come across his channel, it's got some excellent content on there and if you haven't already then check the link in the description which will take you there. He's also got a fantastic Instagram and Behance page and he's a very skilled blender artist particularly when it comes to things like product design. Within the interview I'm asking Derek questions like how did he get into 3D modeling, what was his career path, how much does he charge, where does he look for work and lots of other questions and Derek gives some really insightful answers so do watch the whole thing I promise you you won't be disappointed. So hello Derek thank you for joining me and I uh, appreciate you spending your time uh, doing an interview with me. Uh, if you'd just like to start off and tell us a bit about yourself and your channel. Sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is Derek Elliott. Um, my background is in industrial design. I graduated from Appalachian State University in about 2013. And, um, but I've been using Blender for about 13 years now, since around 2007. Um, and I started doing that in high school, mostly for fun, just uh, kind of making my friends band logos and stuff. Didn't need Blender to do a lot for me back then. And it definitely wasn't as a uh, full featured as it is now, but and over time, I got more and more interested in 3D, and um, and I pretty much learned Blender from YouTube tutorials. So it's kind of always my goal that I would eventually be able to kind of give back to the community. So yeah, about I think two years ago now, I still didn't check that date. I um, it was a January, maybe two years ago. Um, I started my YouTube channel, and um, yeah, it was finally you know able to kind of make some tutorials and uh, it was way more rewarding than I thought it would be. I really enjoyed kind of interacting with people and being able to share my knowledge that I had built up over the years. But um, so that's part of what I do now. Not, I wouldn't say that's most of what I do, but uh, most of what I do is freelance 3D animation work. Uh, and I've been doing that for um, coming up on a year now, maybe like eight months or so. So it's going well, having fun and uh, yeah, happy to be here. Awesome stuff, thank you. Uh, so, um, is it been Blender all the way, or have you looked at other software at all as well? Um, so, my introduction, like in high school, was um, with more CAD type software. So, and, and that's actually where I first used 3D was uh, with SolidWorks, and then I used AutoCAD and stuff as well. But um, you know, shortly after that, I was introduced to Maya. And I used, uh, there was a personal learning edition at the time that was like a free for students type of thing. And I played around in that, but um, it was very frustrating. I mean, Blender was frustrating when I started too, but um, I just, uh, I never got fully into it. And then at some point I realized that um, there's Blender, it's free. Um, so, you know, I, I felt like I had a little more um, ownership over that and kind of mm. dove into it pretty deep. And, and really since then, it's just been... Uh, it's just been Blender. So like I said, I mean, when I started off, I was doing a lot of just, you know, what a high school kid would want to do in, in 3D software. And uh, I didn't need Blender to do much. And like I said, it wasn't very powerful back then. But um, but now, you know, the software, I feel like has kind of grown with me where now I am doing professional level work with it and I need it to do a lot. And um, and it does that. So, um, so yeah, I haven't really felt a need to switch. I'm, I'm a little uh, ashamed of how unfamiliar I am with some other software packages. But um Pretty much just Blender outside of, you know, I do some, I use, you know, Adobe Creative Cloud to um, edit some videos and kind of like After Effects and I use Premiere to edit my uh, YouTube videos, but not really an expert in that. But yeah, pretty much, uh, pretty much all Blender. Superb. Uh, so do you feel like um, Blender has uh, held you back at any point? Do you, uh, was there some job roles that you thought, oh, I can't really do that because I'm only using Blender? Not really. Um, like I said, <coughs> pardon me. Um, <laughs> so no, I, I don't think Blender has really held me back. Um, there's been in kind of, you know, what people would call my style and kind of what I've developed is, is kind of been around the tools that I'm able to, to use. So I'm really, you know, uh, you know, some of my earlier work was kind of this simplistic style. And people are asking like, Oh, how do you how did you develop that style? And it's like, well, it's because I didn't know how to do anything else. So I was just, I was taking the tools I, I knew and, and making work that, um, that utilized those tools, which is, you know, something I encourage people to do is not necessary to look at some amazing piece of work and try to, you know, you get stressed about why you can't do that, but instead, you know, take the tools that you are familiar with and use those. Um, so outside of maybe just a couple freelance situations where um, I would have been on more of a team setting and maybe they were using another software, um, 
you know, that, that is maybe a, holding me back a little bit, but, but no, I mean, I haven't, um, uh, I've, I've still not really considered, um, ever needing to learn anything else, but, uh, I do keep an open mind and I, I know mm-hmm. I should, uh, I should be flexible with that, but I feel like the, the skills that I have in Blender would be easily transferable to, um, other software. So definitely, you know, to answer the question, no, I've never felt like Blender's holding me back. Uh, so uh, can you tell us a bit more about your sort of career path? You said about college earlier. Uh, what was your sort of transition into the 3D world, as it were? Yeah, so um, so in college, I studied industrial design at the recommendation of my mother. Thank, thank <laughs> you, Mom. Um, she, you know, I was interested in the CAD stuff, obviously, was kind of the first big signal um, from high school. I just, I just really, you know, I remember the first day I saw someone, like an older student, rotating a a cube in SolidWorks and like my mind was absolutely blown. I thought that was so cool. So um, that kind of CAD route and just interest in art as well led me to industrial design. And um, and I was able to utilize, you know, I was able to use Blender a little bit with that, but uh, we still worked in more traditional CAD software. So in college, you know, in the classes, we were mostly using SolidWorks or Rhino 3D and um, rendering a lot with KeyShot. But I was still using Blender for a lot of personal projects and then occasionally would use it um, to kind of help me with my um, my school projects as well. But um, but yeah, so so the, the, the degree in industrial design is kind of what um, just got me moving. And I know we'll talk maybe a little bit about, you know, the whole idea about college later. But yeah, that industrial design background, um, you know, I took that into a job out of college and I was working kind of in a furniture design field. And, um, but eventually that just, you know, I was, I was taking on small freelance projects here and there. And then sometime, uh, like I said, maybe a little less than a year ago, I just decided that the, the 3d was really what I was most interested in. It wasn't so much the industrial design or the furniture design, but, um, really what I was getting the most enjoyment out of was the actual, um, 3d modeling animation rendering. And, and there's a lot of design that goes into that as well. So that's kind of the the progression that it took. Hmm. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind me asking, I get asked this question a lot, is uh, how much do you earn uh, doing your sort of freelance work? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, it all, it starts off for everyone real, uh, real small. Like, um, I think, you know, some of the first freelance projects I did in, in college were, you know, the, the old $50 logo. If, if that's okay with them, I actually sent that in an email one time. I was like, Hey, yeah. What about fifty dollars? If that's okay, like as if they could. Of course, that didn't uh, that didn't turn into any major uh, brand logo or anything. No spoiler alerts there. But um, so yeah, it, it's kind of progressed over the years. Um, I, you know, basically the the general idea for me is, and I think for most people should be that, you know, just to continue raising your prices. So. Um, over time, I've been able to charge more and more, just depending on kind of how busy I am. Uh, I'm noticing that, you know, if I have a lot of inquiries coming in, then, um, you know, maybe I realize, oh, I can, you know, bring the prices up a little bit. But uh, right now, I would say I'm, I'm kind of operating in two sort of price brackets, if you will. Um, and and just quickly on pricing, the way I'm pricing my projects now is pretty much all just fixed um, fixed price. So I just... You know, there's a fixed scope, fixed timeline, um, kind of a, we know what the result is supposed to be. And that's not necessarily always a deliverable, but more like what the project needs to do. And um, so, so yeah, the two brackets are kind of, you know, I've done some television, like 30 second broadcasting work. And, you know, for a project like that, uh, I'm usually looking to get between, um, you know, 10 to even $50,000 would be pretty good for me right now. Um, and that, of course, depends on the client, the budget, you know, what they're really looking for. Um, but that's kind of the upper end. And I, and I haven't done much work in that area yet. Um, but if, if you're watching this video <laughs> thinking of hiring me, you know, contact me sooner than later because it's, it's going to get more expensive. Um, but then the other price bracket, um, I'm still really interested in working with smaller companies and kind of one man gigs, like where they're just, you know, Kickstarter, stuff like that. Um, so. For those projects or or also for larger brands, but for more like social media oriented projects where they just need a little bit, you know, they need some content. Uh, most of that work is more in like a like a two to ten thousand dollar range. And so, you know, I, I I talk in these big ranges because that, that's usually actually how I end up presenting it to a client is that, you know, hey, you know, you, you tell me what you are looking for, what you need to do. 
Um, not, not, you know, don't tell me that you want a, a five second animation where the product, you know, comes apart and explodes and shows all the parts. Like, tell me that, oh, you know, customers are having trouble understanding um, how our product fits together. So it's like, okay, well then maybe an exploded animation is the way to go. So I, mm. I usually present um, a proposal with kind of three price brackets where it's like, hey, I think I can help move that needle you're trying to move um, for this much, this much, or this much. You know, the most expensive option I think is going to have the most success. The lower option is obviously less investment from both sides, but um, but can still you know work towards their goal. So I would say those are those are kind of. Um, it's kind of the the charging range, if you will, but it's yep. it's very complicated, of course. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, uh, if you had any advice uh, for um, newcomers into the freelance world, um, what would you suggest that they maybe avoid if they're pricing? Um, well, you know, so hourly billing is a is a thing that most people should do what they can to get away from. It's really hard when you're starting off. You know, many of my first freelance projects were hourly. And, um, and some first jobs were hourly, of course. But um, there's there's a guy who I follow really closely called Jonathan Stark, and he um, he actually has a book called Hourly Billing Is Nuts, and uh, he talks about, all about value pricing, which is kind of what I'm trying to get into, and how hourly billing is bad for the client. But um, in terms of you know if you're starting off freelancing, I would say things to not do: um, don't uh, you know do a lot of personal projects. Um, don't take on work that you don't think is going to really help you either learn a new skill or build your portfolio. And especially if it's also not going to get you a lot of money, you're just going to kind of bog yourself down and kind of get caught in this cycle of um, low budget projects that you're not having fun with. But I think the biggest thing is just to uh, do whatever you can to, you know, stay passionate, do things that you enjoy doing. Um, but of course, you know, you, you still have to pay the bills. So, um, you know, ideally maybe you're working a full-time job and then you can kind of moonlight, um, doing your freelance work and kind of ease into kind of understanding that world of freelance and working with clients, um, but it, it's it's a it, it's a tricky process and many people approach it different ways. But um, I guess those are some of my some of my basic recommendations. That's great, thank you. Uh, so, uh, how about um, uh, someone who's completely new and they're thinking whether to go to um, art school or go down the t the self taught route? What would you uh, recommend to them? And what would be your yeah. advice? Um, it, it, you know, it really depends on what you what you want. I mean, you know, I went to college and I don't regret it at all. I think it was a good decision. Um, but you know, of course, money is the first biggest factor. Is if, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be going into debt or putting yourself into financial hardship to go to college, then I would say don't go. That's that's not a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, most of the skills that I use in my everyday now that, you know, kind of produce the work that I produce that I sell for those prices is all things that I learned um, on my own through, yeah, like YouTube tutorials, watching uh, Grant Abbott's YouTube channel. <laughs> and um, so it so you can you can kind of in terms of the hard skills and stuff, you can develop that all on your own without college. Um, college, in some case, cases will help. But. I think for me, and maybe for many people, um, the biggest advantage to going to a college would be, um, for one, the networking, you know, the sense of community and just kind of having, you know, being with people and working with people, um, you, you know, communication and just the ability to work with other people is, you know, massively important, um, especially if you're going to try to run kind of your own freelance business. So you, you develop a lot of those kind of social skills and just, you know, the ability to interact with, work with critique other people's work. Um, that's something that college, I think, does really well still that's difficult to get if you're trying to learn on your own. Um, and then beyond that would be just the the deadlines, the kind of, you know, you've got professors, you know, telling you this needs to get done or like, you know, you just, if you, you know, for me and maybe some people watching, I have a really hard, I mean, I'm a big procrastinator. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> it, sometimes it's really hard for me to kind of get motivated to, to start a project, to finish a project, to keep going with a project. And um, and college kind of like if, you know, it, it has that schedule and you need to stick with it. Otherwise, you know, your time is wasted, your money is wasted. So there's kind of an external incentive to to really, you know, focus and kind of learn to manage your time. And um, so I, I think that's a big part of it. 
And then, um, and then the other big part is, yeah, the networking, meeting people. Some, some schools, you know, like, you know, where I went to school at Appalachian State University, um, I'm really happy with the, the student network I have. I try to stay connected with the younger students as well as the older ones, um, especially when I was in school. Um, and and that's, that's really helpful. So some schools would have that better than others. I would say in the case of some of the top tier design schools, that, that's almost all I would say that you're paying for is really that network. I mean, you will get a quality education, but the, the high prices for some of those schools, I, I don't think is, I don't think you're necessarily paying really just for the education. I think that, um, you know, the, the alumni networks and the, the people that you'll be connected with. I think, I think that's honestly what you're paying for. Like I know many of the um, um, art schools in California, you know, companies like Disney and Pixar are, are pulling directly from um, people at those mm-hmm. schools and they have programs to even help them get into jobs like that. So um, I think that's something you're paying for in those cases. But back to kind of the main question, yeah, college, it's not right for everyone. Um, I think it was right for me. Um, so you just kind of have to decide, you know, what are you looking to get out of college and then decide is college going to deliver that to you uh so would you have any advice for uh newcomers what they what should they be learning um if they're sort of self trying to self-taught self self self-taught self-teach like um i don't learn blender i would say (laughs) um you mean in terms of like what what would be like where where to start like if if you don't know 3d at all and you want to just be where someone like you or i am exactly that yep yeah i would i would you know, kind of back to that whole passion thing. I mean, you need to, you need to be passionate about the work. So, you know, decide, you know, look at, look at work that you like, think about, you know, what it might take for you to get there. Um, and, you know, you know, starting off, it can be useful to try to duplicate work like that and just, you know, to learn the technical skills. But I would, I would say that the, that the most important thing starting out is really just to foster kind of that, that passion. Don't try to make it a job right away. Um, like with me, when I started Blender, I would, I would start it. I would get frustrated. I would quit for a couple months at a time. I'd pick it back up. You know, I'd quit. If if I was trying to make my living when I was doing that, it would have it would have not been pretty. I would have been very frustrated. I would have been getting getting bad client work. Um, but you know, it was, you know, I, I was using Blender for ten years before I was really using it to earn a living. So. You know, slowly and slowly over time, I was able to, you know, get comfortable with it, learn about what I like, what I like to, you know, do, what kind of work I like to do. So I think that, yeah, that that would be my biggest suggestion is just to, you know, stay passionate about it, try to work on things that you enjoy, do a lot of personal projects, and just uh, and just learn it, have fun, share your work, look for feedback on your work, um, and yeah, that that all kind of just feeds into a, a general, you know, kind of better relationship with. Uh, with 3D in general, um, you know, in my case, Blender specifically, but, um, you know, I, I follow artists that use other software as well. So just, you know, trying to immerse yourself in in kind of what 3D is, why you like it, and decide, you know, maybe maybe it's not something you want to do. So just really think about um, kind of why why you want to learn it. What are you doing? You know, are you enjoying it? And, and then try to maintain that enjoyment. Thanks. So um, would you have any advice for... Uh, new artists trying to get into the industry as well as um, just sort of picking up 3D for the first time? Um, yeah, I mean, back to, you know, again, I think, you know, in terms of getting into the industry, if, if there's a specific company you want to work for, then try to do work that is like the work that they do. Um, I, I think that sometimes people just kind of do all sorts of random stuff. I mean, we all do when we start 3D, everyone mm-hmm. wants to model a realistic human is like the first thing they ever do or which is extremely difficult or model like a high-end car um so you know if you want to do something like that then yeah learn that but um i would say you know focus on finishing projects and and try to do work in the style of what you would eventually like to be hired for so just yeah i mean just kind of you know think about what you're doing why you're doing it and and decide you know, you know, if you're really targeting a specific job, you know, what what is that company going to want to hire you for? Like, what do they do? What would your job there be? And kind of what are the skills that you need to to have that? And then, honestly, I'll add to that because I don't think I've mentioned it enough because it's so important. But 
um, talk to people, meet people, connect with people, like go outside your house. Um, you know, most, you know, they, there's a saying that's like, it's all about who you know. And, you know, it's not all about who you know, but it's a lot about how you know, especially in terms of getting a job. Like you, you are going to have a million times easier time if you if you're connected with someone at a company or or they've seen your work already and then they said hey we have a job open um you're going to get that job you know way easier than somebody who's just you know filling out an online application so um so just building a network telling people what you do and having them and being interested in what they do as well so it can't be a one-sided thing um you know i'm always reaching out to other artists like and it's not for any particular reason you know just other than sometimes to just appreciate their work like hey this is great and you know some of that can foster a relationship um but yeah just i I think a really important thing is just to to do what you do um obviously work on being good at that and and having people know what you do so i i would say if you ask pretty much any of my friends like what does derek do for a living like I talk about 3D so much and I broadcast that so much that I'm pretty sure everybody would say, oh, Derek, he does 3D stuff. You know, they might not know deeper than that, but but that's enough to um, to kind of create that little, you know, thought in people's head where, you know, maybe you could be a potential freelance client. They think, oh, who do I know that can do 3D animation because their company is looking for something like that? You want to be the person that they think of. So... Um, you know, being connected to as many people as possible and having them know what you do and, and that you're passionate about it because then they're going to be uh, more likely to, to hire you or want to, you know, give you a job or something like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so uh, on, on to you specifically, um, how do you find the time uh, to learn uh, new things whilst doing all these sort of freelance jobs and so forth? How do you uh, or where do you go as well to find sources to learn from? Yeah, I mean, really, it's still YouTube. So I, you know, in terms of getting new, you know, learning new things about uh, Blender or just really anything, it's, I'm like, I'm living on YouTube these days. <laughs> There's just so much good information. And, um, and, it, and it's just, a, it's a really, for me, at least, it's a really digestible format to be able to just kind of find a video. And, and, and sometimes I'm, I'm searching for a specific thing. And in that case, you know, a lot of times I'll have to be diving really deep on forums or something like that for something really specific or technical. But in for the most cases, it's just just kind of watching, yeah, like your YouTube channel, other <laughs> Blender YouTubers channels, just, you know, when a new video comes out, maybe it's not something that I really want to do, but there's always going to be little tidbits and techniques kind of packed in there and just things that kind of make you think about something a little bit different way. So that's, um, you know, it, it is hard to balance though. Like, you know, on my own channel, if you see there's, <laughs> I'm not the most regular uploader. It, you know, when there's a big gap, it's usually because I'm working on a freelance project. And and that does become, you know, to be able to charge some of those prices I'm charging, I really do have to pour myself into those projects to be able to deliver something that I'm um, proud of and that's gonna work for them. So, um, so you know, it, it is a balance, it's a juggle. But um, yeah, I, I would say just in general, just you know, the, the passion will just kind of cause you to learn like, whether or not it's intentional. Just I'm interested in Blender. So when I open up YouTube and I see that Grant Abbott has a new YouTube tutorial, like it's just I'm going to click on that, like over, you know, something else that's not related to 3D and Blender. So, you know, that that passion just kind of drives continuous learning. Mm. Uh, so uh, have you got a favorite piece of work that you've done? Um. I, you know, it's, it's mostly, uh, mostly personal projects are, are the things that I really have the most fun with. Um, and most of that appears on Instagram. So, you know, I did a, uh, I did, there's this challenge called 36 days of type that happens every year where, um, kind of artists from all different fields create the letters and numbers of the alphabet and kind of interpret them as, uh, yeah, as whatever they want. So I did kind of, I did that last year. I did architecture. So I did all these little tiny little houses and stuff. That was a ton of fun. I'm actually doing the project again this year. I'm only a few days in. So uh, keep your uh, um, <laughs> wish me luck, basically. But um, but I also, I would say the coolest like singular piece of work that I did recently was this little um, shape-shifting pots animation. It was for this uh, weekly challenge called Render Weekly, where 
Um, it's mostly industrial designers, but you know, if you're a Blender user, check it out. Uh, the challenge is usually to design and render something. A lot of people are using like Keyshot and stuff in there because it's so industrial design focused. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, they had a challenge that was to design and render cookware. So I was like, oh, that's that's no fun. That's boring. And um, so I, I Googled cookware and and then, yeah, sure enough, it's it's boring. <laughs> like it's, it's a lot of this, you know, you see like the same little objects, like similarly shaped and colored, packed into this like image awkwardly. And I was like, ah, oh, there's got to be a better way. And um, so I fired up Blender and um, I had this idea to kind of have the, since the pots all look pretty much the same, but they're just like different shapes. I was like, oh, what if we, uh, what if it just like morphed between the shapes? So, so yeah, that, that project ended up being very cool. I was really proud of it. I even, I think I even posted that like, this is the coolest thing I've done. It was, yeah, just, you know, just was really psyched on it. It was fun. And, um, and I finally just yesterday released, uh, released the tutorial covering that. So if you're interested in making your own shape shifting pot animation, it's thing, lots of, lots of clients in the shape shifting pot world. I'm just, <laughs> it's a, you'll learn some good techniques and, and yeah, that was a, that was a really fun recent piece of work. Um, so have you got a, a specialism in the 3d world at all? Um, you know, a particular specialty, uh, I wouldn't say so. I mean, again, a lot of my work is kind of driven by the tools I know how to use. So my specialty at first was making very simple things because of that. Um, but I, I would say I, I try to really bring in the industrial design background as much as possible. And it's not necessarily that it's uh, intentional to try to bring that in. It's just that um, that's kind of the way I learned in the design process. And then and then it's just also something I'm so interested in, like product design, product animation, and just like, you know, nice realistic lighting and stuff like that, I would say is something I'm really interested in. But that kind of manifests itself in different ways. You know, obviously, I like to do things that are very like unrealistic and kind of almost cartoonish, but, you know, still have really nice materials or lighting. So um, I'm, I'm still kind of deciding exactly what my uh, <laughs> specific niche is or, or what I would ideally have clients hire me for. But, um, but yeah, I would say, you know, more design focus. I definitely don't do a lot of character animation. Um, so anything that's just uh, crisp, clean. Um, <laughs> and then I'll also just, you know, I, you know, kind of back to the design thing. I do like to um, imagine my work as having, you know, a purpose beyond just being art. So, um, you know, whether it's to show a product or um, to kind of explain something, you know, I, I do still do a lot of product visualization. So you could say that's maybe a specialty, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's kind of all over the place, but I, I'm, I'm slowly kind of narrowing that down. Um, but a lot of it does tie to that design background and just a general interest in kind of, you know, basic design principles of, you know, balance and composition and things like that. Mm. Uh, do you have uh, anywhere where you particularly go for inspiration at all? Nature. No, <laughs> um, that's the uh, that's the cliche answer. Um, you know, not really. Uh, a lot of people would tell you, you know, if you if you're a three D artist, then don't look at other three D artists, or you know, if you're a painter, don't look at other painters. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people encouraging each other to look at fields outside their own, which I do. I, I encourage that as well. But I think it's okay to look at other people that do similar things to what you do. You know, most of the people who I follow on Instagram are other 3D artists. And um, because what we do is so technical, a lot of times, you know, sometimes seeing those techniques can be really inspirational. So not necessarily, you know, seeing their whole piece, but like, oh, how did they, how did they get that to do this? And, and that can kind of spark up an idea of, you know, how else that technique could be used. Um, so honestly, I mean, I really do. I look at a lot of other 3D artists, but um, beyond that, just, you know, taking a break sometimes and just kind of, you know, trying to just avoid looking at a screen, you know, go back, go out in nature. Um, <laughs> but just, just anything that'll, anything that'll just give your mind a break and kind of let it process. I think a lot of, you know, my good ideas come from, you know, just, just walking around, taking a shower, like it just, it just kind of pops into your head and, you push it away, but then it comes back and then you push it away and it comes back. And then, and then those are the ideas that you kind of want to develop a little bit more. Mm. So uh, when you're marketing yourself, uh, what have you found the most successful tactic or have you got any tactics as it were? Um, I didn't think I had tactics, but I started getting clients. So I started to think, what were my tactics? Um, so if I was going to look 
back on kind of some of the things that have worked well for me so far, I would definitely say social media is massive. I um, I didn't have an Instagram page for a long time because I didn't want to share pictures of my cat or friends and I didn't want to see pictures of other people's cats or friends. And I was like, I don't, what's that for? Um, but, you know, eventually I was like, hey, wait, I'm doing all this 3D stuff. Maybe, uh, maybe I could put that up there. And, you know, just slowly doing that and, and I mean, it, that did slowly kind of generate a following and it's not, it's not all about the followers. Um, but it definitely like, if people are interested in your work, you know, sometimes they'll follow you and they'll see more of your work and, and that, and that all kind of plays into like, you know, the algorithm. And, and so that honestly, Instagram has been pretty instrumental in, um, being able to, to talk to people and bring on clients and kind of back to a point I made earlier, you know, just, you know, your ability to network and work with other people. Um, I think one of the most powerful things about Instagram is its messaging platform. So just the fact that, you know, I can see some artists that I really appreciate and just send them a message that says, Hey, I love your work. They might not respond. You know, now, nowadays I have, um, you know, coming up on 10,000 followers, which isn't like a ton, but it, it's nice. And a lot of people see that and they think like, oh, this guy, like a lot of times people message me and then I respond and they say, oh my God, I can't believe you responded. And it's like, well, yeah, like I don't, I mean, I, it's still manageable for me. You know, I, I'm, I'm getting more and more messages, so it's getting more difficult. But, um, but you know, just that, you know, being able to connect with people. So a lot of times it's just, you know, people who are doing what I used to do, you know, just appreciating the work. Um, but then also occasionally that would be a potential client. They're like, Hey, like, you know, I saw you do this. Could you do that with our product? And, and a lot of times that, you know, those conversations can turn into freelance projects. And then also I use a Behance so that, you know, I've had that for a long time. That's kind of another slowly building platform or it takes a long time to build it. It's a very popular platform. If you haven't heard it, heard of it, I would check it out and get on there. But, um, Behance also has a messaging system, um, but that, that's another good way for your work to kind of um, get exposed to other people. I mean, just anything that can get your work in front of people, and like I said, having people know what you do, I think it's all gonna feed into kind of, you know, your marketing strategy. Um, and then I'll also mention LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, um, I didn't use much for, you know, that type of thing until recently, but um, there's a really organic, um, kind of growth on LinkedIn where if people like your work, then it will go out to their network. And, and that, that lately has been really powerful. And just because of the conversations happening on LinkedIn, a lot of times that brings in some more qualified leads, bigger budgets. Um, so that it's really worth uh, checking out. But yeah, I mean, so all three of those are social media. So I would say in terms of, you know, marketing, like just be, be online, be as many places as possible. Um, you know, you, you might think that you're, if you search your name, you know, you see all the stuff, but people, you know, there's information overload. So if you, if you're only doing something every once in a while, it's, it's just not going to, people aren't going to see you. They're not going to know it. And, you know, you don't have to overflow. Like you can look at how frequently I post on YouTube and uh, Instagram and stuff. And it's not, it's not super frequently. I mean, with this 36 days of type project, it hopefully will be every day for 36 days, but, um, but it, you know, don't overthink it, but just just be there, be out there, connect with people. Um, that, that I would say that's the the number one um, strategy is just be visible. Mm. So you've got uh, Instagram, Behance, uh, YouTube, and and others probably. <laughs> um, what yeah. what would you say is the key for uh, gaining followers then? And do you think gaining followers is important? Um, so that that's definitely like a hot hot topic. Um, it's like there's no denying that the more followers you have, the more engagement you're going to get and the more eyes will be directed to your um, profile. And maybe 1% of those eyes are clients. So if you have um, a thousand followers, then 10, is that one? <laughs> yep. then you're 10 of your potential clients. So if you have a hundred thousand, then it's going to be way more. I won't try to do the math, even though it's really simple math. Um, so yes, I mean, have, having more followers definitely can help, but they have to be the right followers. Um, and that kind of answers or starts to answer the second part of the question, which is, you know, how to get those followers. And I would say that, you know, consistency, not necessarily in how often you're posting, but, 
um, what you're posting. So if you're um, like a lot of people, you know, know to come to your channel because you're very good at, you know, some game art and things like that. And, you know, so, so being consistent in the type of work that you're putting out there, I think is, is really valuable. And, and, you know, if, if you post a picture of your cat one day and then you're posting a 3d animation the next day, if I go to your profile and I see the 3d animation, love that, but, oh, you've got a cat here too. I don't, I'm not really interested in that. And for all I know, if that's all I'm seeing, like there's going to be more pictures of your cats. And I've said a couple of times in this discussion, <laughs> I don't want to see pictures of your cat. So just, you know, being consistent in the type of work you're doing, um, I think is really valuable. And um, yeah, if, if you're continuously putting out the same thing, um, then people will follow it. Like imagine a, a TV series, if it was a completely different topic, like, like what if, you know, Stranger Things, a really popular TV series. What if, you know, one week that was Stranger Things and then the next week it was The Bachelor? It's like people are going to be like, I have no idea what I'm what, what I'm what I'm here for. So um, so consistency will keep people coming back. We'll encourage them to follow you. And then those followers, um, the right followers will uh, undoubtedly lead to, um, you know, more freelance work and just yeah, having having a bigger following, a bigger audience, more people that you can tell about your work, what you do. And as I've said, that's what kind of flows into the whole um, kind of funnel of marketing and just um, becoming, you know, known about what you do. Mm, yes. So um, with all this, have you got any aspirations uh, for the future? And are you um, maybe one day going to move away from freelance and into sort of um, a company or anything like that. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so I enjoy freelancing. I will probably do it for the foreseeable future. Um, but, you know, I think some people, and I, I work from home, this is, uh, you know, some people I think they really, like their dream would be to work by themselves from home. Other people hate that where they, you know, they have to be around people. They have to be in the office. They have to, you know, have just things happening. I would say I'm kind of more, in the middle where, you know, I do enjoy being able to kind of control my own schedule, but you know, again, I am a little bit of a procrastinator, so that can be a problem at times. But um, yeah, so I am interested in joining up with, you know, a company or a team or just, you know, being part of a larger project. That's another thing is, you know, if you're really just gonna work by yourself, there is a limit to what you can do. Cause I mean, when, once you cross kind of a certain threshold in, in you know, budget or what a client is asking, you, you just can't, you can't do massive projects by yourself. It's just, you have to work with people. Um, so, you know, I, I am interested in working on bigger, cooler, better things. And, uh, and I know a lot of that would have to happen with other people. Um, and it's not just that, but, you know, I do in, in part of what has made my, you know, I keep air quoting marketing. <laughs> part of what's made my marketing successful is my ability to connect with people and, and that, you know, that same ability and interest in connecting with people um, works really well in like an office environment or on a team. So the, and then the other part of that would be that um, to learn. So you if you're if you're just at home by yourself, you know, you can watch YouTube tu tutorials and learn. But I think I think that there really is a lot of value in like sitting next to someone or just you know having a conversation with someone about something that you can't necessarily have as easily or as you know fluidly online. So. That would be the other big thing uh, or the big draw for me to work on a team would be to work with people who are more experienced with me that know more. And um, and I just, you know, I, I know I know that if I was working with, you know, more experienced people that I would be learning things and learning things is a good thing. So. So, yes, I would say in the future, you know, I would like to be you know not just freelancing. I'll probably always do a little freelance work, but um, it would be cool to be on a bigger team. But then beyond that, I mean, uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation, the YouTube channel has been really, really rewarding. I, I didn't kind of expect that when I got into it. I thought, oh, I'll just make these tutorials. People will like them. But um, I didn't realize how much, you know, not just people would like them. Not I'm not trying to brag there. But, like, it's really rewarding to, you know, for me to kind of take my knowledge, package it up. It, you know, it only takes me a few hours to record a tutorial and put it together. And then, you know, the fact that, you know, people can spend hundreds of thousands of hours watching that and, and kind of receiving that information. Um, like, I, it's like, it's almost like I should, I should go to jail for, for not doing that. It's such a good, you know, value transfer, you know, for the work I put in and the, and the value that comes out, being able to share that knowledge. So um, I would like to put a little more attention into the YouTube channel. 
Um, so yeah, YouTube, freelancing, um, getting married soon. So that's, uh, that's <laughs> not, I guess, not an aspiration anymore, but it, it's it's on the agenda. So uh, yeah, trying to trying to step back a little bit, I think, is another aspiration. I I kind of realized at some point in recent years that. You know, a lot of people say like, oh, you know, how, how are things going? It's like, oh, really busy. And that's usually like people see that as a good thing. But uh, I'm trying to more and more realize that that's not a good thing. Like, you know, you want to be busy in the sense that you have work and you can make a living. But um, I think many people will become overwhelmed with how much they can be doing. And, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of that as well. So, you know, learning to kind of step back a little bit, relax, you know, take a little siesta from time to time uh, I think is important so I'm, I'm trying to get better at that as well thank you ever so much that's just brilliant and uh, congratulations on the the marriage <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I hope all goes well with that and of course uh, wish you the best of su success with your YouTube channel and all the work that you do thank you very much for joining us um, here yeah well thanks for having me uh, it's really fun talking to you I definitely uh, it's it's fun to uh yeah the, the communication thing it's fun to you know kind of have that one-to-one -one chat so uh yeah really appreciate you having me and um thanks everyone who's watching this for watching and uh yeah i'll uh i'll i'll be in touch i'll be here i'll be online <laughs> so once again you can find derek elliott's youtube channel in the description do make sure you check it out there's so much good stuff on there i'd like to say thank you once again to derek and please let me know if this is something that you'd like to see more of by commenting below so until next time, thanks for watching.